Emmy and I are excited to welcome you and to introduce you to Jean Shin if you haven't met her yet. Um, I am here in Cozy Cottage, the original church family farmhouse at Oana, and I'm looking out the window at all the trees and really thinking about Jean's project as we have been for the last few months. Um, we at Oana have been very fortunate to work with Jean since earlier this year and really recently every day and seeing her project evolve. Um, it opens officially on Sunday, May 2nd. We welcome you, Alana is free and open to the public. Anyone can come see it on any day. Um, and we really do encourage you if you want to, to come and see it while it's still in process. Um, we've been excited to see, see the installation emerge on Alana's East Lawn next to the main house. And we never quite know what's coming next and we run out and see what's happening. So I wanna give you an overview of what we're gonna be doing this evening. Um, Jean Shin will be giving us a very brief presentation about her work. Then Amy and I will in, uh, engage in a conversation with Jean and at the end, you can ask her questions and we will moderate those questions. So we're excited to introduce you to Jean and Amy, we'll take it from here. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so pleased to be here with my colleague, Mark Przorski, and, and thrilled to be able to uh, be with all of you tonight. Thank you for making the time. I'd like to introduce artist Jean Shin. Uh, Jean is a nationally recognized artist for her monumental installations where she transforms everyday objects into elegant expressions of identity and community engagement. She's had numerous solo exhibitions at prestigious institutions such as the Museum of Modern Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, and Storm King Art Center. More than 150 cultural institutions, including the New Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts in both Boston and Houston, the Asia Society, the Barnes Foundation, and the Museum of Art and Design have featured her work. As an accomplished artist practicing in the public realm, Shin has received large-scale commissions from major public federal and city agencies, including the United States General Services Administration, New York City's Percent for Art program, and the Metropolitan Author Transportation Authority in New York City, where I worked with her on two monumental projects as part of MTA Arts and Designs program. In 2016, she completed a landmark commission for the MTA's Second Avenue subway at the 63rd Street Station in Manhattan. Jean has received many awards and extensive critical acclaim for her work, she was born in 1971 in Seoul, South Korea and raised in the United States. She lives and works in Brooklyn and Hurley, New York. She attended the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 1999 and received a BFA and MS from Pratt Institute where she is a tenured adjunct professor of fine art uh, and a recipient of Pratt's 2017 Alumni Achievement Award. She serves on the board of the National Young Arts Foundation and is presently the president of the Joan Mitchell Foundation. So Jean, on behalf of all of us at Olana, we are so thrilled to welcome you here tonight. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's so great to see you guys. Um, though strange to see you over Zoom since I've been seeing you on Olana and her beautiful site. Um, Thank you so much again uh, for all the attendees. It's a pleasure for me to engage you about my practice. And with this invitation, I thought I would share a little bit of an overview of some of those ideas and how it lands um, in our, what I feel like is an epic project at Olana. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go. Okay, um, so much of my practice um, is working with everyday objects and in particular things that I rescue. And for me, this idea of finding discards, finding objects of inspiration, um, both in our everyday, but on the streets as well. And so my early projects were taking um, some uh, a painter um, working with objects to someone who then um, found inspiration from the objects and trying to reintroduce these objects in the public space. So these are some of my early installations, rescuing umbrellas uh, that were discarded after a storm. And 
and harnessing that for the wind. Um, this is a project I did at Socrates Sculpture Park, um, creating canopies and really interacting with the elements. Um, I would also find shoes. Um, and I bring this project up in particular because it relates to my Olana project. Um, when I was looking at these incredible um, sh fashion items, I was also questioning its materiality. And uh, my typical strategy is to deconstruct these materials to find them to be um, revealing its histories. And for me, this history was that we were wearing another animal skin on top of ours, but it would be um, so disguised um, because of the fashion, uh, because of the kinds of, um, you know, uh, torment that the, the materials go through in the hands of a designer. And what I wanted to reveal was what is happening uh, for the user? Um, what are areas of things that are invisible that we often don't notice, don't um, see? And this could be um, underneath our shoes, the soles, almost like a drawing in space, um, talking about our histories and our movements. Um, I also um, took that project about leather and was able to remake a different um, kind of body of this material. Um, whereas the shoes turned into hide, here in spring collections, um, when I had the fortune to be an artist in residence at Materials for the Arts, I was seeing the stream of industry, fashion industry, uh, museums and so on, um, take their waste products and redistribute it to artists and nonprofits. Profits. And what I found were these beautiful cuts of leather, perfectly cut out, almost like the prime meat of this leather skin, um, and yet left behind the edges, the scars, the wounds. And in that, I wanted to reconstruct what I felt was a body, uh, an, an absent body, one that we don't acknowledge as being a, uh, a living, breathing thing that we had sacrifice for our consumer needs. So these voids I thought were also so mysterious because we project all the things we want, um, our um, notions of desire onto this um, material. And you could see those beautiful texts, those upholstery texts. They'll come back to my Olana project. So I wanted to show you that I had been thinking about leather and upholstery tax and, and to a certain degree, um, a lot about the body in my early projects. So this is where the body turns flat, um, clothing um, represents um, people and, and people's identities. In particular, this is at the Museum of Art, thinking of how do we um, create a portrait of each other um, in a space full of hierarchy um, and oftentimes people who are behind the is institutions are not visible. So as an artist invited to have an exhibition, I really wanted to turn the frame back on itself to look at the people who actually make the institution run um, and often unseen. So this idea of the invisible um, behind the architecture, behind the space is also a community that I want to tap into. Um, other projects, of course, um, are site specific. And so a lot of the ideas come from um, the place and an exhibition, an invitation at the um, Smithsonian American Art made me think about um, our American identity and in particular, the monuments. Um, and here was an object that I wanted to create as an everyday monument, something more intimate, um, looking at our trophies and yet transforming the meaning of trophies, not to centered around youth or sports, but actually at work and the people who are often not getting acknowledgement what, of work of this kind of frontline work as we call as the central workers. Um, and so this everyday monument was a placeholder for this kind of um, other uh, memorial to give. Um, and I've always created projects with 
um, keeping in mind the objects waste stream. And um, one of the biggest culprits right now, of course, uh, is not just only fashion, but um, technology. We're constantly upgrading so quickly and they're designed for obsolescence in mind. So as we upgrade, um, we often forget um, what happens to the actual physical hardware. Um, and they end up often in our landscapes creating toxicity. So this is an object that um, is very extractive to our landscape and then after our use becomes again integrated and becoming part of the um, e-waste that have nowhere to go um, and the kind of massive amounts um, that it is um, transforming our landscape. And so this was an exhibition I called Pause because I wanted um, us to reflect and to be able to physically be in this space contemplating uh, the sort of horrors of what we are doing that we often don't see when we think of the kind of um, seduction of technology and how the screen allows us to um, hold our attention and yet we forget what we're really looking at. Um, and so these ideas of the paradox that we live in and every day has been a running theme in my work. Um, I also wanted to talk about how these objects hold cultural history. This is how Amy and I met through a, a commission through MTA. Um, so I do these large-scale permanent works as well. And in that space, I'm trying to introduce objects that have cultural richness and a connection to the community, but often are also uh, fraught with its history. So this is Korean Celadon, an object that is prized all over the world um, and the way in particular the Koreans um, artisans make them. The production is so sophisticated that 40 to 60 percent of their um, artistic production is flawed um, and so they destroy them. And for me, the idea of, a, uh, of that level of waste um, for them to not recognize this perfect vase and to uh, destroy them. Um, well, in that way, I saw it as a potential for my own work. And so we imported two tons of ceramic waste uh, to my fabricators, Stephen Miyoto, and they transformed them into this beautiful object that lives in many different forms. And here in a sculptural form that gets to travel all over the country and to really fuse people's interest in this cultural um, uh, beauty, but I also think of it in terms of the Korean diaspora, um, how we're broken shards. So every material has many layers of metaphors, um, both with this cultural production and its history, but um, how it relates to people. Um, I'm also showing um, recent projects that I've done um, using different vessels, whereas the vase um, and the ceramic um, celadon is so prized, we forget that in uh, an America in particular, um, we don't necessarily want to be known for this material, but this is a Mountain Dew bottle um, that I um, realize we're so consumed in high number and extremely addictive um, and that the name does uh, not do any justice because it has nothing to do with nature and often very, very toxic. So a lot of my projects engage communities. Um, oftentimes I'm sourcing the material locally and using um, the labor of the community at large and here where they lack um, arts education, the educators of the museum engage them to actually make my sculptures. And then the sculptures would be installed at the museum. Um, and here I wanted to make a corn maze, turning this industrial product into something that looked organic. And it was in some way a critique about our changing landscape, how um, farming is no longer seen as something healthy and productive for our body, but in fact, more like an industrial factory. And so I created this form on a labyrinth to imagine um, us being lost in this kind of new foreign landscape and um, trying to find our way out of this environmental crisis that we're in and hoping that we don't take the shortcuts, um, but in fact, taking the hard, long road um, to 
um, environmental recovery um, or changing our practices. And so here is another version of that um, maze now floating as if it's a mirage um, in our often food desert. Uh, this is a retail space where almost anything you can imagine is around us. Um, during the time of the pandemic, I felt like we were all worried about our food chain um, and uh, healthy food products since health was the biggest thing we were were consumed with, and yet uh, Mountain Dew bottles were everywhere. Um, stocks of our shells um, always had a bit of the high fructose corn syrup that I, Iowa would produce and um, in all parts of our um, supermarkets. And, and yet access to fresh foods um, became such a challenge for us. Um, the plastics, um, of course, a lot of the remnants of my project still live with me, and I turned them into other projects. So this is going to be a project that I've um, created called Evasives, which is the end caps of the Mountain Dew bottles, and they will also be um, installed in Riverside um, Park in New York City. And they start to grow like mosses. And I'm thinking a lot about um, what is native and what is natural and what is actually paradoxically not natural at all or native to our environment. I'm getting close to trees, which is the project that we're going to be um, doing at Olana. Um, so I have been um, thinking a lot about tree health and also how decorative trees are, but also how vulnerable they are, um, how they've been cultivated, how we plant them, how there's so much part of our identity, our, our cultural specific heritage. So I turn these knives and uh, flatware into a severed stump. Uh, and stumps continue to be so important because they hold the record of the tree's life um, once it is cut. And I wanted to reveal that kind of history behind what we think is this ornamental natural thing that is also very much cultivated. Um, I, the last project I worked with with living trees um, and actual trees was at Storm King. Um, they were going through a revitalization project, um, changing their landscape because their beautiful maple trees um, in their alley um, were declining. And that is a phenomenon that is happening all through uh, the East Coast. Um, so with a difficult decision, they decided that they would remove these trees um, and plant new sustainable um, gum trees. And at the time they were getting rid of 24 trees, which I asked them to save and mill on site instead of having them chipped away in the landscape. And here I wanted to make it seem like all those trees suddenly fell, which is kind of what was happening in the landscape. Um, but instead of having them removed to hold that memory on site. And so it became sort of a memorial for me and in some way a chance for me to mourn this um, species, um, this maple tree that gave its life and a beautiful canopy, a destination and a, a marking in the landscape. We transformed them into a picnic table. Um, so it had a real function um, that was really needed from in, in my um, reflection about a Storm King's um, massive destination to see sculpture and people feel the need to run around. Um, and I wanted actually the, uh, for the visitors to hold um, and gather instead. Um, and when they do, of course, they're both looking at art, but also um, touching um, and uh, intimately experiencing nature, um, nature that is an, uh, under decline and being able to kind of examine firsthand what is happening um, in the landscape. Um, in that project, I also left the stumps um, so that people can see them as sort of scars in the landscape before they were removed and new plants were replanted. Here, I love this idea of this horizontal sculpture or communal space. And the work just disappears when people activate it. And to me, this idea of holding uh, the landscape 
um, and imagining something that we don't necessarily see, but know that exists. Um, and that is true for maple syrups um, sugar production. Um, unlike the Mountain Dews that you see in the virtual screen behind me, this one is truly natural, uh, processing sap um, and turning into this beautiful, uh, tasty um, treat. So nature is a gift to me um, and to all of us, uh, and yet it is in great decline. Um, this is the gum tree that is um, uh, planted next to this gigantic um, uh, maple tree. And um, you could see that I left two of them as markers in the landscape looking at the trunk. And for me, the trunk was the body. Um, and the limbs were removed, the canopy's gone, and yet the tree remains. And I think that's where um, Olana comes into uh, a conversation. Many of my projects um, are layered and uh, one conversation picks up in another project in another site. And further north, um, the hemlock tree, this beautiful tr majestic tree that was 140 years and counting, I think, um, uh, fell um, and had died um, after several attempts, many years to save it. Um, and at Alana, um, when that tree fell and Amy Mark had invited me to engage in a project, um, I wanted us to remember this tree uh, and to honor it. Um, and this was at a time coming out of the pandemic and I all felt like we all needed um, to physically gather. And the tree became sort of this metaphor for us to imagine um, all that we have lost. And um, in the research that I did, um, the hemlock tree is so special because it had offered this incredible bark um, for leather production across the Hudson River and the Catskills. So in the 1800s, um, many of the towns that we think of today were the names of tanning industries. Um, and they had come to deforest um, the Hemlock Mountains um, and literally removing the bark. And so we did our very modest um, reenactment. Um, uh, thankfully, the curators um, got a hold of a donation where we could use the original tools, the historic tools that were used um, when debarking happened in a different time period. So we gave a um, commemoration for all this what the trees have witnessed, but also trying to remember that uh, it was part of the ancestry um, of the trees that had all fallen. And here in our century, we are seeing this one amazing hemlock that I feel like is a gift to from church who had planted this tree, uh, witnessing the horrors across the river and wanting to preserve this tree and the hemlock in his um, beautiful Olana. Um, and so I hold the bark because that was this incredible material underneath um, the bark that was the trunk um, that was removed. And then I'm going back to this leather. Um, I had this leather remnant that was also thrown out from the fashion industry saved. And so I'm creating a second skin for this trunk that has been peeled away um, from its precious bark and then recreating sort of an armor um, by using upholstery tacks and reconstructing um, its protective layer. And I'm hard at work this um, month. So you, any sunny day, you'll see me working and um, kind of trying to reconnect um, these historical traumas, but also to honor this one tree um, that is a legacy of um, church. And I also um, am thankful that we have this great volunteers who are so committed to Alana and there are still existing hemlocks in the landscape. And so part of the project is a mapping project, identifying and sharing the love of hemlocks. 
So I designed this um, branding logo for the hemlock trees um, that were um, also then seared onto the leather uh, remnants and um, volunteers and in public programs, people are invited to look for hemlocks in the landscape and then put these leather tags on them. And thankfully we had this gorgeous day um, with Professor um, uh, Rebecca uh, Ryder who walked us through the hemlock grove and how beautiful and important the hemlocks are to the ecological um, uh, um, systems at work, um, how it's a foundational uh, tree um, and a habitat that encourages so much of the environment to thrive. Um, unfortunately, today we have an invasive um, that is really um, taking over um, the hemlocks from doing that. Um, so these little um, egg sacs um, will be transmitted to tree after tree and holding um, uh, this new threat that is happening, um, not necessarily through industry, but through globalization and how we spread these invasives um, to our native habitats. Um, so I want to end here and encourage you guys to come um, see this project uh, unfold um, and then be completed in May. Um, it will be up all year. And to me, it is a chance for us to be, um, not only physically gather in a beautiful, safe outdoor environment, but also to have a tactile experience to be able to touch this tree, um, to be able to kind of see it in the most intimate detail as possible. So I'm ending it here in hopes that we can, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> end it here. And so we can um, open up a conversation between Mark and Amy and open for questions. Wow, thank you, Jean. That I have so many questions and I'm sure everyone else does and Amy, I'm sure you do too, but I, um, I, if, if it's okay, I'll ask the first question. Yeah, I, um, please. You know, so, you know, hemlocks have been one of my personal, it's my favorite native evergreen. I planted them in my own garden. And we know that Frederick Church in his lifetime planted hemlocks at Alana at a time when this region was deforested in some significant ways and church was actively engaging in reforestation. So I, we should point that out. It's, you're helping us through this installation and your work here to talk about layers of history and this landscape as being a work of art and intentional landscape in ways that we couldn't do. We've been doing it, but you're, you're giving us a new way to do it. So what I've noticed for myself, someone who really has cared about hemlocks for years and our staff and our visitors is they're all saying they're going home and seeing hemlocks in a new way. So I'm, I feel that way. And I'm wondering just for you personally, like what was your connection to hemlocks before, during, and like what, what, what are you going through in terms of hemlocks? Oh, um, so uh, we have always, um, you know, on our little property in Hurley, um, we get our little saplings from the New York State uh, native um, uh, tree inventory. And we're always trying to uh, plant. And so I think I'm trying to do my own part. And uh, my husband has grown up in New Hampshire in these beautiful hemlock groves and he has such fond memories. And he always says they're his favorite, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we have been growing them. And then of course, we're finding out that no one else is really planting them because they just know that they're going to die soon and it's not worth it. And I just think, well, it is worth it. Um, they, they, let's give them a fighting chance, you know? So for me, when this hemlock um, uh, fell at Olana, it was that sort of same conversation. Yes, of course, it could be a normal uh, cycle of life, trees age, trees die. Um, but when they're, they have this new threat, I think we need to do everything possible to be able to restore and give them a fighting chance. So for me, this is like, uh, a, ch a chance to talk and send a different message, um, our passion and love for hemlocks uh, to be able to share and identify them. Um, because of course there are lots of other evergreens, um, but hemlocks are extremely special and will be mm -hmm. rare and rare to see one as majestic and old as the one um, that this, the current tree um, was part of. 
right. Yeah. I just heard today actually from a, a landscape uh, colleague that there is a bulletproof hemlock, which is supposedly not as susceptible to the woolly adelgid. So we're interested in exploring the bulletproof hemlock. Stay tuned to learn more about that. Jean, one of the dreams that I had, I know Mark shares this, most of our staff has shared this idea that we really love the idea of an artist working on site, being here at Olana, this place of incredible natural beauty and artistic inspiration. And I'm interested to understand from you kind of the feeling of communion that you might have with a 19th century man who created this cultivated landscape. You as a, a Korean American woman in the 21st century, what does that feel like for you? What's that experience been like for you? Well, I, I labeled being on top of Olana and working outdoors as my outdoor studio. So. <laughs> I have co-opted his um, beautiful uh, estate as kind of this idea of, of being in that same space of an artist creating on site and how amazing it is to experience the light and time of day. Um, but honestly, for me, I was a painter, so I was trained, um, in fact, in plein air, um, going out in the landscape even as early as middle school and, and deep into my high school period, spending time outdoors learning how to paint. Um, and I realized that it wasn't really painting that I was invested in more than being outdoors and observing what's in front of me, observing the, both the landscape that I was um, painting, but watching the light change, uh, mm -hmm. hearing the birds, um, that quietness, being left alone just to be with myself in solitude. And so for me, I think um, that association of being able to paint out the landscape means that I get to spend time and paying attention and being with nature. Uh, and this project has allowed me to do that in the most intimate way. And I'm loving every minute of it. So I feel very grateful um, to be in that legacy um, and to then of course share the important messages um, that have come from looking so closely at this tree. Yeah. You know, I think about where we started with you in this process, and mm. that to me has been my favorite part so far. I think what's next might become my favorite part also, but you know, where you started with this, and I should point out that this has been a group project of Will Coleman and Allegra Davis and mm -hmm. Ida Breyer and Karen Keo. And Liz, I can go on and on and on with all the staff members working on this project yeah. with you, but um, and it's given us a great opportunity to do more research. So I should put a plug in for that also. But where you started when the hemlock had died, we did try to save this hemlock over a number of years. We did a project near the house. The hemlock was important to us. Amy, you were involved. We brought an arborist in. We tried to mm -hmm. save it. We, it finally died. It was in such a, 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 a risky spot. We couldn't leave it. So it didn't fall. We did, it did have to be cut. Um, it's in a state park. But um, where, how did you get to the point where you thought that you were gonna go in this direction with this hemlock. So I, I knew at a point you weren't doing this and then you changed your mind. So was there a moment where you where it clicked for you? Tanning industry, leather, any of that? Oh, well, doing the history uh, research, mm -hmm. um, it was amazing to see the connection between the leather that I was obsessed with and thinking about um, animal hide and the whole process, you know, and how we don't often think of our leather goods as coming from another animal, uh, that this is their skin uh, that we use as a protective skin. So that strange connection, these two materials that have no re relationship um, in the modern world actually had a very deep and tragic consequence, um, two tragedies in one, um, and also how that shaped and changed our landscape today and what we think mm -hmm. of the Catskills and the towns and so on. So there's a deep legacy um, and it's mostly teasing out um, like what has happened you know, and to really deeply understand um, how we can prevent uh, that sort of um, deforesting and the kind of tragic consequences um, that we experienced. Um, so for me, it was beautiful to imagine the tree as a site, you know, a body, you know, mm -hmm. and to think how, is it possible to preserve it? Is it possible to almost dissect it and see what has happened. And in fact, when we opened up the bark, there were so many 
it had been a host to so many other inhabitants for years while it was dying, you know, um, insects, woodpeckers, you know, all these ants, of course, you know, they were inside the bark. Um, so it's all part of the ecosystem, you know, but what's strange is to have leather come into that conversation. Um, so that strange encounter and trying to reckon and reconcile with it. Um, I wanted to acknowledge this kind of trauma that we put on both to the tree, but to this animal um, and to kind of make peace with it, you know? Mm. And so it's rescuing these remnants of leather that are incredibly beautiful and meant to be. They're so luxurious, um, beautiful in color. Um, they're exquisite to feel. And that's why these are the trappings of consumerism, right? Mm. Um, we want our leather bags and our shoes and they should last for a really, really long time. Um, so this material then um, gets to honor um, this hemlock um, that also is part of um, their very entangled history. You know, um, I wanna mention that Tim Dodge from New York State Parks helped us with cutting the tree down. We're very grateful for his help. And, you know, New York State Parks, we don't cut trees down unless they have to be cut down. Um, I think it was an interesting experience for him. It certainly was for me to be able to pay so much attention to this one specific tree. And then when you cut it down, Jean, and you decided to position it the way that you did, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, um, about the idea of it kind of lying in state on the East Lawn. Can you share some of your thinking about that positioning of the piece? Yeah, when we knew the tree ultimately had to go down, otherwise it's gonna be dangerous. Um, right, exactly. That moment was so quick you know, how a tree falls. Uh, of course, it was nice that it was planned and safe as opposed to when accidents happen. And we know from these storms and the storms keep coming very quickly um, that trees fall all the time. Um, they're not able to withstand, you know. So when it fell, it, it was in some way feeling that horror of like this tree falls and we can never go back, right? Um, but then there was a moment where we brought in um, a you know, contractor to place the tree. And for me, that was a moment where I could be very spiritual and say, what would this tree want for a moment? You know? And I thought we could like levitate it, <laughs> of course, using a crane, but still you know, a six ton, uh, 6,000 pound tree to be lifted in the air just for a moment you know, floating. Um, so for me, that was a sense of um, imagining it going to a better place, you know, mm -hmm. and it leaving its physical body behind. Um, so this whole notion of this horizontal to me was how, you know, in many Buddhist cultures or um, ideas of spirituality, it's really not the physical body that we're thinking about, but really the spirit, you know. Um, so this one tree, represent so much of um, the cycle of life, you know, uh, and we're all part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we did position the tree at this kind of height that feels like an open casket. Um, in some way, I know all of us have gone through so much pain during the pandemic and lost and know so many people um, who have died. And to me, this is a process of grieving um, it's hard to grieve when we don't physically come together. It's mm. hard to grieve when there is no ceremony, you know, the singing of song, the hugging, the touching, the holding of hands, you know, all the uh, rituals that we have that allow us to process when something um, is so painful and gone, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is us holding this tree um, and acknowledging what we have lost that it's not just the one tree, the body of this tree is sort of the metaphor um, of the historic thousands of trees that we lost across the river. But, you know, every day um, the cycle of life continues and with climate change, you know, we have um, made it speed up in a way that is really um, impossible to visualize. So here we are being able to see this one tree visible in front of us um, all that is happening underfoot. Yeah. You, you mentioned the spirit of the tree or the spirit. And, 
you know, what that really, I thought about that when, you know, we should note that our colleagues at New York State Parks, when the rings were counted on the tree, the tree's life, the tree was planted approximately at the same time the main house was built at Oana, yeah. in that range. And that to us was, we just couldn't believe it. And, yeah. um, you know, when you think about in Frederick Church's day, looking out across the view toward the river and the Catskills and they would have been deforested. The scars would have been visible. And we talk about the Oana view shed and the Oana view shed is something which has evolved over the years. And, you know, it just, it's out of sight, out of mind, but your, your work has really helped us to sort of think about that history. And I think you had mentioned that you, um, you first came to Oana, you came to our last collaborative exhibition with the Thomas Cole site, River Crossings, where we had, you know, Chuck Close and Maya Lynn and Martin Purrier, these different artists in the house. and. I should also note that your work is going to be part of a bigger collaborative collaborative exhibition with the Thomas Cole site and the Crystal Bridges Museum, which opens on June 12th. So I do need to mention that as well. But what is your sense of Alana as, as it sort of evolves, emerges for you? So now that you're really living in it, I know you've touched on this, but I'm just curious about what you're, what's on your mind. Um, as far as being at Alana yeah, and like, yeah. Alana's legacy, well, it, it's actually really funny. I, I get to listen to a lot of the public walk through, mm -hmm. you know, spending hours. And someone said, does Alana have a last name? How come they didn't put her, uh, they say Frederick Church, but how come Alana <laughs> doesn't have a last name? Right? I just thought that was really beautiful. Yeah. You know, it is a living legacy and people see it as a person and, and they, and they want to understand who is Alana, you know? And so it's no longer like a work of art. It's no longer a vision, but it's a living, breathing, um, experiential engagement, you know. Uh, and I see that every day, you know, after an exhausting day, figuring out how this, how to, you know, reconstruct this uh, skin onto this tree. Um, I get to see the sunset every day, you know, right before I leave and I have to pack up before it gets completely pitch dark. Uh, but I am awaited and rewarded by that gift, you know, the views of the Hudson and the, the light, you know. Uh, so for me, it's every day at Alana is different. And we said every season is different, you know, you get to appreciate those, um, but it gets active by, you know, the artists, the visitors, all their questions. Um, and so I think that's been kind of the wonder of um, what will Olana be, you know, more than what it, what is it to me or what is it today, you know? But I think there's, you know, the possibility to be accountable as to what Olana can be. And I say Olana as a metaphor for like Hudson Valley, it's like really the view, right? Looking at the river and looking across the river too. Uh, and some days you said you could see all of Massachusetts even, you know, so, and possibly even New York. So it really holds the, the future imagining, you know, as Churchill had done. So I think uh, it's for us to determine like, what do we care for? What do we give our attention to? And so much of this work has been about like spending time with something that actually is already dead. Right, but in some way you mentioned like scars and the landscape and, and it's a process of healing. And I think just kind of reckoning with like the past and not all of it good, but also in the healing process to imagine what can we do to really protect not this one tree, but really the landscape at large. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some folks might be interested in understanding how we got to this place. Um, we first started talking with you before the pandemic, and uh, we were talking about the wonderful, gorgeous project that you did at Storm King, the um, Alley Gathering, which was such um, kind of a perfect pre-pandemic project, right, where everyone came together in this gathering place. And through the course of events, we realized that um, we weren't going to be able to work with you on that project, but it opened up an opportunity for this project. And I remember a conversation we had a long time ago uh, about another project for the MTA where you birthed this beautiful idea and proposed it and it didn't get selected. And instead it found another home at a public school in New York City. And we talked about the fact that sometimes when you birth a project, it just has to find its place. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and how that might relate to this experience of how we came to where we are right now with this commission at Olana. 
Oh, thank you so much. It is true that the artistic journey is complicated. So especially when I do site specific work and it's very proposal driven, you know, um, then the project uh, exists in such a site and it's meant to be for that community, right? Um, but oftentimes the, the deeper conversations continue, right? So um, I'm happy to say that Olana's project um, continued my love of trees and things that I couldn't necessarily do in Storm King, and we had plenty of do, things to do just to create that one sculpture. Um, it's now moving to Art Oh My, so people will be able to gather again, and we could talk about maple trees because people are still very, very vested in making sure that the decline um, is also, um, you know, um, not taking over the landscape as well. So here at Olana, it is a uh, part two. Um, and I feel like those are a great conversations about what could have happened, you know, um, but in fact, when you start a new journey, it's always great to land where Olana should land. And for me, um, Olana being on the top of the hill has always been about the view and looking out across the river is where I've spent the last year in Harley, New York, so it really connects me from coming to Brooklyn to Hudson Valley, falling in love, you know, and then cross the river to see Olana. So it really maps us and our connection mm -hmm. to um, our, the landscape, um, the local landscape, but also how we're all interconnected. Um, so I'm really, in some strange way, pleased that you did get the LA gathering. It found another beautiful site mm -hmm. very close by uh, in Art Oh My that people can gather, but that it opened up this whole new uh, conversation that you and I and um, this in incredible community um, at Olana are having right now with Hemlocks. Well, we all agree, I think, with that 100%. Yeah, yeah, you have really, I mean, this is a great example of an artist doing this intervention and really helping um, helping our work here. So thank you, Jean. I wanna make sure we have time for a few questions. So yeah. maybe we could jump in. This is, um, yeah, uh, Mimi Brausch uh, didn't write a question, just a comment. She passed by Alana today. She wished she had stopped in to see your work in progress. So, um, and she's enjoying the presentation, but Carolyn Keough, our director of education has, the first question, and she's asking, now that you're working here, have you changed your mind about anything? Has there been a change a, a change in what you've originally intended to do? And I'm hoping I'm getting this question right. Um, what, what's changed for you now that you've started? Um, I would say really, um, there hasn't been really a change. I mean, you guys know the proposal was what it was, and it ended up being very, very close to that, you know? But what I want to reckon with is that it took a while to get there. And because it was so moving, honestly, um, to see every step of the tree and to be able to honor it in different ways. So um, even though the final product, you know, looks like the proposal, there's an incredible process that we went through and I've grown so much and become so attached because of that journey, you know, with each of the participants, um, all your leadership and support. Um, so that part is something that is, again, not very visible, um, but to me, I've changed. I don't know if the work has changed, I know I have. So, and I hope that that kind of sense of transformation uh, not only happens in the work, but to every person who's looking at a hemlock or has done the tagging or, you know, the conversations that you and I have had for sure. So I, I'm hoping that the transformation is in each of us, not necessarily the work. Mm -hmm. There's um, a comment here from uh, William Thoyer. I don't, don't know how to pronounce your last name, but uh, he says, I spent uh, 10 years of the, of, in the mountains in the forest of Alaska, and it, it's helpful to ask permission to cut plants, either for passage or purpose. Um, and I love that. And I want to say something and then ask a question. The first thing that I will say um, to William and to the group is when I joined Olana uh, two years ago, I noted that that tree was in decline and I went out and talked to it every day. I went out to really, really wanted to try to save that tree. It had such an important presence on the landscape in its kind of verticality and juxtaposition to the monumentality of the house. And um, the day before we cut it down, I did go out to that tree and I did kind of thank it for its time. Um, and Jean, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about what we, what kind of the beautiful blessing that we gave over the tree when we were 
kind of approaching it and debarking as an honoring of that tree. Is that something that you normally do in your work? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, you know, it, it, it does come up unexpectedly, I, I would say, not by intention. I'm not going out necessarily <laughs> to commemorate things or create memorials. It just has been um, the thing to do, I think. You know, I think we all stepped up realizing this tree has witnessed so much, so much, and we need to remember it. Um, for me, it's the tactility. Um, I feel like you don't really have to speak it. It's not that we have to make fancy speeches or say what the message is. It's like when you touch this tree, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and I, I feel like that what you're saying, seeing it, being witness to it, um, that that that's the work, right? It doesn't have to be this grand thing. It can be the little incremental small things that we do every day um, that really matter. And um, so it's true that we all touch that tree and, and Will um, Coleman did allow us to have this moment of silence. And I think that was a beautiful ritual that we're all you know, connected through the physical touch and the tree allowed us to, to be able to do that. Um, uh, so it's just a small part of what we can do. Um, I'm sure there'll be other occasions that I hope that um, we can do regularly. Mm -hmm. in, in our practice and our daily life. So uh, Stuart Chase has a what might be the million dollar question. We're in this journey together and it's a process. What might happen at the end of this uh, end of this um, installation? It goes through October 31st when uh, Cross Pollination, the larger exhibition closes. So I believe you're in process. We're all in process with this. Mm -hmm. but I don't know if you want to say anything more about it. Yeah, I think we haven't landed. I have some um, desires of like, oh, what are the other ways that we acknowledge and have a rite of passage and the ending of a, like a cycle of life. Uh, so I hope that uh, there is this support to be able to realize the next transformation of this tree. Um, I want it to um, in some way go into the landscape as well. Um, mm -hmm. It is a massive material that obviously um, no one person uh, really um, uh, owns or it's not property. It's really from here and for um, this community. So I, I hope that there's a way to, you know, move it to the next step in keeping with that ethos. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I think we had a conversation that if it does, in fact, October 31st is just before the Day of the Dead. And we've talked a lot about the Day of the Dead and the history of the Day of the Dead and Mexico and the church connection. So we have some more kind of noodling to do, I think, in talking about mm. that, what we can, can think about with this tree. And I think our visitors will help inform the direction yeah. also. I think that's part of this whole collaborative process. That you're yeah, what do we need now, I think, will be the question leading to the fall. It's true. Um, there is another question that I saw. It's, it's also from our wonderful colleague, Carolyn Keogh, uh, who directs our public programs in education. And she says, um, while the piece relates to trauma, mourning, and memorial in some ways, I'm wondering if you might speak a bit about how this project relates to hope. And in particular, Professor Rebecca Pinder, of course, who joined us from Columbia Green Community College for a talk last weekend about the biology of um, the hemlock woolly adelgid. She talked about um, the resiliency, um, she talked about extinction. She talked about the concept of looking at time much more than just in our little bits of time, but in centuries and millennium. And I wonder if you could think a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a really great idea of, my work has always centered around the optimism. Um, so when things fail, when things get discarded, I'm like seeing it as a potential. So I mean, I see the hope of this item. And so in some way, when the life of a tree ends, it's, I think it's just the beginning, right? It's just the beginning for us to have conversation. It's just the beginning for us to understand what happened here. It's just the beginning for us to say, what can I do? Uh, so these are all acts of hope um, to reimagine um, what we can change um, so that we are thinking about the future. And so some of it may just be that there isn't the immediacy the immediate answer to those 
uh, questions, um, but that we are hoping just as church left this gift that we are thinking about what is the gift that we want to leave um, the future generation, you know? Um, and so I, I think of that as being extremely hopeful when I think about the future. Um, I don't want to live in the past and I don't want to be driven only by, by my present needs. Um, so I think that's hopeful. The future is hopeful. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want to be mindful of our time. We're approaching an hour. And um, if anyone does need to drop off, um, we completely understand. Uh, we will continue for a few more minutes because there are a few more questions. But if you are dropping off, we encourage you to visit uh, visit Alana as often as you like um, and see the evolution of this great project. So we have another question, a little bit more of a nuts and bolts question from Linda Stillman asking, um, how long ago you were given the commission and how long it took you to come up with the idea. So this is a public private project. The Alana partnership has commissioned you, but we're, this is all also very closely at Alana State Historic Site with New York State Parks. Um, but uh, so how long did it come take you to come up with the idea? I can't remember. <laughs> it's I'm so in the moment, yeah. uh, living the day to day. I have no idea. When did our first conversation start? Uh, I know we tried to talk about the LA gathering. And yeah. we and many there, was, there was a point where last summer, I remember we were talking about whether something with the tree you had made different. It, Last summer, the, the I know that the, the idea wasn't fully formed. I think it happened late in the year, wasn't it? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Jean, you first came to visit two years ago, and we started talking about LA Gathering, and then we had a little hiatus because COVID happened, and then there was this this um, little kind of gem of an, of a, an opportunity with that tree and um so you know i just i am so thrilled to be able to work with you again after our long history together and i am so grateful to the supporters and to the alana partnership um, and to our colleagues at new york state parks for really working so collaboratively and so much in partnership to be able to make a project like this happen it's really um it's exciting and you kind of set a tone for wonderful contemporary work that's coming, as Mark mentioned, for the next exhibition. And we're so happy to have you be part of that cross-pollination show. It's wonderful. Thank you. I, I have really enjoyed the collaborative dialogue. And so when you guys said we we're doing a public programming and possibly an artist talk, I said, no, it's got to be the dialogue again, because it really has been, you know, from the get go, three of us talking and reimagining what the possibilities are and arriving at some place. And that has been the rich, you know, conversation. And I, I think that uh, is true to spirit. Um, I know that for me, the research just allowed me to think of this proposal and my past work um, with leather and that connection with the hemlock was something I had never in my wildest ideas imagined that I would be doing. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's so special. Like I could not have realized it in any other context except here. And then that tree um, being so linked to church and his ideas about um, wanting to preserve um, nature and um, to try to reforest. I think that is just such a beautiful story and narrative. Um, so I'm incredibly moved. Um, and to me, it's a process of healing, you know, mm -hmm. and um, not to be isolated. I think we are just way too isolated. It's been amazing to be in dialogue and in dialogue about repair and care. And um, that's been um, such a meaningful thing to focus on. So I can't even remember what the timeline is at this point because I'm just in that process. Well, there's something that's part of it that I know kind of came later in the project, but is such an important part of the project that we're doing, which is not only the sculptural element of the tree, but also the mapping project. And we talked about that a little bit. We're excited to be able to work with Columbia Green um, faculty and students on that project. And I know for New York State Parks, our biologists are really excited about some of the material that we're going to data we're going to be able to collect. But can you talk about the kind of concept of community and how community always is part of your work? Mapping is always part of your work. How does that fit into this part of this project? 
Um, yeah, it was wonderful. We weren't sure if it would be an open project where, quote, anyone who comes to Olana would be able to do this identification and tagging of hemlocks and really appreciating uh, hemlocks really intimately. Uh, at the end of the day, the hemlocks are incredibly visible in the winter time, you know, so and there was this wonderful team um, of volunteers. And so with Caroline's help, it was wonderful to activate um, this action of identifying and doing the walk through Alana. And I just um, met the full team who have really been behind the scene doing this work during the winter. Um, and it's been so amazing to see and hear from them how, you know, they're obsessed with hemlocks, you know, they've also done walks and of Alana uh, or along areas that they've never gone before, you know, because it's always so, sort of a, a path that you go to as, and you stay on the path and to be able to uh, be close to these trees. Um, so there has been so much about this community building and um, connections that they have not only to each other and to Alana, but to the landscape um, and the kind of stories that they're going to remember um, this winter of, 2021. So mm -hmm. for me, that kind of connection for the community is so great. And uh, it happened for a small dozen. Um, I think for me, it's not about the, the numbers necessarily. It's about the deep connection of experience that they have. Um, but I know that they're going to be sharing this um, in a lifetime um, forever. They will be thinking hemlocks and be sharing their passion and love um, for finding them in the landscape and what a moment that is. Uh, mm -hmm. So for me, that's great. It's the community of trees that I want to map. It's that they're still there. Um, we just have to take notice. And I feel like that's how I think of community building, not about outreach and numbers, but about just who's here. Mm -hmm. you know? And it's really um, not people community only, but the community trees that I want to for us to witness. John Skarnickia um, has a question comment um, that he met you years ago when you were collecting pill bottles for one of your projects. And his, <laughs> his, his, his comment is really that um, you are, you're helping people to see. So you, and he wants to thank you for that. And actually I wanna thank you for that because mm -hmm. I believe you're really helping all of us to see differently. And um, that's what great art does. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I so appreciate uh, the contributions to the pill bottle for sure. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that that project is linked. I, I think of all these projects that I'm thinking about, you know, I was thinking about our bodies and how resilient they are, but also when, when we are vulnerable in need of medication, uh, how quickly a modern medication can change us you know, and also be create a dependency, right? Um, so when I was asking for prescription pill bottles, it was talking with people at the most vulnerable points um, mm -hmm. about what they're struggling with. Um, so even though it seems sort of like flippant, like, oh, you're just this orange bottle, I'm gonna throw them out. In fact, um, the conversations were incredibly um, fraught and private you know, that they were sharing with me. And many of the nursing homes, um, the elderly who take so much medication, you know, they said it's actually hopeful um, because I don't actually know, I know that I'm not gonna outlive, but I know my pill bottles well. And to contribute mm -hmm. to your work seems like there's a collective idea of suffering and a life lived, you know? And I can't physically help them, but the objects hold that memory and continue to be with the work. Um, and so I thought that was really beautiful um, and so generous of people when they donate to the projects. Well, it's also at Olana, I, I note an, something, a note from one of our, our colleagues that it also helps to bring people in as volunteers. And of course, we love that. As Mark mentioned, Olana is free and open to all. We really are here to be in service to the community, but to be part of the community, to be with the community. And um, a project like this really helps us to do that. So um, thank you, Jean, for allowing us and for kind of getting that moving for us with this project. Of course. And um, we should add that on May 2nd, also opening with you outdoors in the landscapers, some really great works by Portia Munson. Yes. Um, so throughout this COVID period, more people than ever are visiting Alana. We've been working on focusing on a much bigger idea that Alana is a complete work, large scale work of environmental art. And 
people are discovering that and through your work, they're discovering it even more deeply. So mm -hmm. I wanna thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, I think we've hit the, uh, our limit with time and questions. So um, Jean, we will see you on site very soon again. Yeah, and the rest of you too, we hope. Come and visit us at Alana very soon. Thank and there every sunny day. Good, great. <laughs> you are beautiful in the sun or the rain, any days. Any days are beautiful here at Alana. Okay.